Hello, everyone. Wonderful to see you here today. Thanks so much for coming. My name is Sharon Danks, and I'm the director of Green Schoolyards America. I'm the coordinator of the National COVID-19 Outdoor Learning Initiative. And you are here today in our community of practice for schools and districts who are moving learning outside. And this is our incredibly our 33rd meeting since July of last year. And we meet, for those who are new joining us today at the beginning of the school year, we, we've met weekly over the summer of 2020 and then bi-weekly since. And this is a place for, for schools and districts to come together and share information with one another about what you're doing to take learning outside. And we also share resources that the initiative has been putting together. And we, we, we try to also have special guests come and share their work, which we have for you today. So the meeting is hosted by myself, Sharon Danks, along with my colleague, Lauren McKenna, and Nancy Strineste is also joining us today. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Nancy Strineste, to introduce our speakers. Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy Strinisty and the director of East Coast programs at Green School Yards America. I'm also a designer and I've been creating nature play and learning spaces for children for many decades. I uh, first connected with Bria Public Charter School about 10 years ago when a teacher there took a class I was teaching on designing your own outdoor space and she transformed one of Bria's sites as her project. I was really taken with their comprehensive model of multi-generation education, which you're gonna hear more about today. In 2018, I got to design the outdoor space at another one of their sites and got to know them even better. That site was a really interesting one because the building and the outdoor space are both shared between two schools, each with a different mission and approach. Outdoors, one side of the divided space is a traditional manufactured playground with rubber surfacing and plastic and metal climbing equipment. But the other side is a nature play space that I designed filled with tree parts and rocks and plants and sand and water. And during the pandemic, Bria has been a pioneer and an inspiration to DC because they stayed open in person and outdoors all year. The partner school on their site was not back in person. So Bria had the opportunity to use both sides of the play space. And they were able to observe some real differences in children's play and behavior. Today, you're gonna to hear from two of the Bria team about that and about how they planned and carried out their incredible pandemic year program and how those experiences have informed their work going forward. Lena Johnson is the Director of Early Childhood at Bria Public Charter School, where she has been working since 2014. She has a master's in inclusive education and a PhD in education from the University Siegen in Germany, her home country. And she has worked in Germany, Spain, South America, and the United States in the field of inclusive education as an inclusion teacher and as a consultant. Her topics of research and work focus on inclusive education, playful learning, and the connection between nature and play. Developing the outdoor learning program at Bria has felt like going back to her roots and her childhood experience in a German-involved kindergarten. In her free time, she enjoys exploring Rock Creek Park and other green spaces around DC with her husband and her two sons. Um, sadly, our second presenter, Lydia Mackey, was called away by a family emergency, so she won't be able to be with us today. But I wanna tell you a little bit about her. Lydia has been working at Bria since 2018, first as a lead pre-K teacher, and most recently as the outdoor curriculum specialist. Prior to working in Washington, DC, Lydia taught preschool and kindergarten in Istanbul, 
where she discovered her passion for outdoor education and also the ways that it encouraged language development in English language learners. She has a degree in art history and modern languages from the University of Miami. And this fall, she'll join Harvard Graduate School of Education as a science fellow, where she hopes to study the ways in which outdoor education can benefit the behavioral health of children who have suffered from trauma. Lydia aims to nurture creativity, bonding, and beauty in her young learners through sipping tea from antique cups, grinding herbs and orange peels to make perfume, and mixing flower petal soups. Lisa Lucino has stepped in at the last minute to fill in, and we are so grateful to her. Lisa serves as the Senior Director of Early Childhood Strategy <clears throat> at Bria Public Charter School in Washington, D.C. Lisa enjoys being able to work with both adult and child learners in Bria's multicultural, multi-generational setting. She is a former preschool teacher and she's provided extensive early childhood training and coaching locally and nationally. She derives inspiration from the transformational educational experiences that her colleagues have been able to continue to provide for children and parents even in the midst of a global pandemic. And it is really inspirational. Lisa is a bilingual English, is bilingual in English and Spanish and holds an MA in International Training and Education from American University. Welcome Lisa and Lena and thank you. Thank you so much for having us. We're excited. So um, we will pull up our slides that we prepared for you today. Um, and we're really just honored to be within this group of um, outdoor learning experts and interested participants. And thank you for, for the overview of, of who we all are. So Bria is a, um, a public charter school, a two-generation public charter school in the District of Columbia. During this time that we have with you, we want to focus on a few different elements today during our presentation. We're going to be focused mostly on our pre-K program. I mentioned we're a two-gen program. And in this group, perhaps there might be questions about how a pre-K curriculum and its structure can be applied to older students. And yet we hope that this short presentation will be useful in encouraging everyone to think with a trauma-informed lens for all learners. What are the needs of students that lead to misbehavior, worries that they will misbehave when using um, outdoor spaces or outdoor materials, and ways to establish trust with students and um, meet their needs before any misbehavior occurs. I also just wanna start out by emphasizing that we believe that young children were some of the most impacted during the pandemic. And so thinking about this last school year, excuse me, about this next school year, it's not too late to even adapt programs slightly to include longer free play outdoors or opportunities for teachers to take their lessons outdoors in, in sections to alleviate some of those inevitable physical needs that students are going to have, having been confined to the screen or to their homes, um, that wiggling and the need for big body play, it's inevitable. And we all know as adults how torturous it can be to sit in front of a screen all day. So imagine our youngest students. And we can move on, Lena. So I mentioned that we're a two-gen school. Bria's mission is really to strengthen families through our culturally responsive two-gen education. We have adult education classes, which include ESL, digital literacy, um, child development and workforce programs, such as a CDA program and an MA program. We also have infant, toddler, and pre-K students on site. You will see that in the orange circle. And then the integration of those two things happens during our family time when adults and young children interact together. Most recently, that's been more and more outdoors. And we have a strategic partnership with Mary Center, a federally qualified health clinic, enabling us to provide comprehensive wraparound services, such as healthcare, social services, and, and everything that families may, may encounter needs for. So that's a bit about, about Bria. 
our pre-K program is, I mentioned that we have infants, toddlers, and pre-K uh, for parents who attend BRIA, maintaining that two-generation model. We use a project-based curriculum, and for the past five or so years, we've been uh, Reggio-inspired in our approach. And really, the teacher-child relationships have always been at the heart of what we do in social-emotional learning. And we focus, we have a heavy focus on materials and loose parts and all kinds of opportunities that are going to build or oral language development. We certainly focus on all areas of child development, but almost 100% of our students are dual language learners and English is not their first language. We have a heavy focus on the use of materials and experiences to promote oral language and a very robust family engagement component with a lot of homeschool connections. So outdoor learning has been the perfect way to um, maximize that. These are, this is a photo of, our, of three of our four sites. Last year, we were able to use, we have four sites across uh, Washington, D.C., and we were able to use three of our sites for in-person learning during the pandemic. So you see a little snapshot here. One of the site had access to a small garden, which was really just a backyard sized garden. And it was in relatively good shape, but it needed some improvements in order to make it work for year round outdoor learning. Uh, we had to prepare garden beds and cut back bushes and put up a sun and waterproof roof. The second site did not have access to a green space. There was just concrete and a lot of trash. Um, so the summer prior, we uh, removed the trash, uh, the railings, and planted grass, as well as built gardens and set up tents. We had an amazing um, cadre of people and an amazing facilities engineer who helped us with this monumental task, as well as a gardening, a part-time, a very part-time gardening teacher who accomplished so much in, in those small amount of hours. The third site was the only site, uh, Nancy spoke about this site because this third site was the only site with a beautifully designed outdoor playground as well as a traditional playground. And so for that site, it was really more just about setting up the tents. We also set up outdoor hand washing stations and did a lot more planting. So that one was in relatively um, more of a workable uh, shape to get going with outdoor learning. And at this point, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Lena, to talk about some of the planning phases that we had throughout the year to make this all work. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, how did we get started once we had the spaces ready? And as Lisa pointed out, it's really important to mention that this was really a school-wide effort and a close collaboration between all school staff, involving our maintenance and custodial teams, our teachers and teacher assistants, our early childhood coordinators, our outdoor learning specialists, our director of operations and the leadership team. What was new is that we were able to create the halftime role of the outdoor learning specialist. That was Lydia who was going to present with us today. And this allowed her to dedicate time to work with the teaching teams at each site to purchase and distribute supplies, to help families get rain and winter clothing, to develop beginning of the year curriculum and work on special projects such as composting uh, and butterflies. Taking a little webinar here. We were also lucky, as Lisa mentioned, to have had a gardening teacher. We were able to consult and to, to ask questions. And we were in contact with outdoor advocates who helped us to get, for example, tree stumps, um, which seemed impossible at first, and made winter hats um, for our families. So that support net was very important. In order to plan for, organize, and or buy materials and other outdoor equipment, we divided the year into planning phases according to seasons. We also sent surveys and conducted meetings with teachers, as well as prepared ahead of each season to learn about the teachers and parents' questions, concerns, suggestions, and wish lists. This allowed us to prepare for and adapt to the needs of each site and the team, families, and students at each of our sites. Um, so materials we used to get, we, we collected and bought to get started. This slide shows you an overview of the materials we got for each site um, to help us get started with outdoor learning last school year. As you can see, most of the materials are inexpensive and they don't have to be new. Um, this was Lydia worked a lot on 
helping each site and this team of, of you know everybody worked at each site worked together but for the bigger infrastructure we got in the beginning pop-up tents and replaced them later um, by the big permanent tents we used yoga mats and those lap trays or lap tables or tree stumps tree stumps to sit on and tree stumps to use as tables for gardening we got um, buckets and shovels for each child, potted herbs and flowers, compost bins and worms, and soil, dirt and water. And then sensory, that was a, also a big project. We got different sizes of sensory bins and different loose parts to measure and pour and play with. And then a collection of animals that children could play with. And it's so much more fun to you know, pretend play when you have actual sand and water and you can build um, houses and hide. And um, that was very, very a successful experience. And then also gross motor materials, balls, cones, tricycles, hula hoops, and a set of math and literacy materials such as clipboards, paper, art supplies, blocks, and funnels, measuring cups and spoons. In the end, it was really not this, you know, that you can see the materials are pretty inexpensive um, and they're not hard to get. And we felt like it was similar to what we would have usually, you know, needed in the inside classrooms in order to get prepare a new school year. Some of the core questions we asked ourselves when we started was how can we engage children's interests while keeping them safe, especially during the pandemic? How can we follow the health and safety guidelines and explain to a three, four, and five-year-old, you know, they cannot be close together or that they have to wear a mask. What are children's greatest needs after extensive time indoors? What tools do teachers need to move into a brand new classroom? And how can we reach our math and literacy targets? And so it became clear that having some structure, some guidance, a curriculum guide would really help teachers to break the day into different parts and sections um, while also emphasizing flexibility. And so Lydia worked on creating a beginning of the year study guide that breaks the day into different parts and includes lots of sensory movement and art activities with the materials that each site, each teaching team received. We were able to build on, as Lisa explained earlier, when developing this guide, we were able to build on the experiences that we had collected from, you know, prior years outdoors with the beautiful place, natural play space Nancy created for us at one of the sites and some garden spaces we had used and teachers as well as students had shown us in years before how important it is, how much better they feel when they're outside. And so the experience they had collected from the prior years was infused and, and embedded into this guide. And now we are updating the guide with all the new experience from this year. So we have even more experiences. This is what we've been talking about. This is this playground, the two playgrounds. This is the space that we share with another school. This is the more traditional uh, playground on the one side. And then you see on the other side is the, the more nature nature play space um, that um, Nancy designed. And we were able to see, it was interesting when we started with full day outdoor learning during the pandemic, originally I had thought, well, for this site is easy because we have this great playground and we have this natural sp play space. And then we realized that having this fixed structure actually did not lead to that deep focused play that we saw in spaces where we didn't have a, a fixed structure. And so that really became our, our model, this, you know, this natural play space where children have an open space, they have access to sand and water, lots of loose parts. And we were able to see a much more engaged, much more focused play, much more collaboration, imaginative play. And, and that's something we were able to see throughout the year at all sites. And here you can see this is how we started with very simple pop-up tents. This is at, well, this is actually one still for Totten side. The other one is at one of our other sites. Still, the children had the opportunity to sit and squat and run, jump, use the sensory bins to measure poor. And it was incredible to see how, how focused, how engaged they were using natural materials and just being outside. This is a quote from Bessel van der Kolk from his book, The Body Keeps the Score. Um, agency starts with what scientists call interoception. 
our awareness of our subtle sensory body-based feelings. The greater that awareness, the greater our potential to control our lives. We noticed that almost immediately, um, as soon as we started with outdoor learning, children were better regulated and they were calmer. And we noticed that when their physical needs are met, it opens up other areas of their development. That close connection between body and mind really was so visible. And we, we could see that for children and teachers, being outside felt like being in a yes environment, where teachers could trust children and allow them to explore, to investigate, to be who they are. And children felt that trust and were, were able to, and more it felt encouraged and, and safe to ask questions, to try out new things, to solve problems, to you know, ask for help and help each other. And this deep learning and this trust and self-regulation that students were able to discover and explore during this time really set the foundation for all learning that happened last year. And in addition to the, this, you know, the social emotional learning, we saw lots of cognitive growth and, and deep, deep learning because children were so connected to what they were learning and talking about. Um, for example, just in the world of digging, um, children learned about erosion, plumbing, different tools, dramatic play, for example, hiding a treasure or you know, digging up a treasure, absorption and other real life problems. And we felt that that power of trusting the children really led to more child-led play, to deep, deep investigation. In addition, uh, we had lots of more slides, right? But we wanted to focus on social emotional learning. And at the same time, we were, saw that math and literacy skills were embedded throughout the whole day outside. They're constantly, children are able to measure, to uh, compare, to swords, um, they're able to count, they're able, you know, using their clipboards to write and draw what they see, to read and then act out stories. So there is lots of opportunities to, to work on all areas of development. And one of our greatest successes um, of our outdoor learning program, thanks to many lessons we also learned through the community of practice and winter outdoor webinars, is our investment in clothing for our families. And we were able to help all of our families and, and also teachers to have the necessary gear, the rain and winter clothing to come to school throughout the whole year. And families actually reported that children um, were so excited to come to school that they, you know, they jumped out of bed and, and they told their parents, I want to go to school despite the you know, rain or snow and uh, they, they really kept track of time that they knew the days that was, were virtual and the ones that they were on site. And on those days, they just wanted to go. They woke up early. They were ready to go and so excited. And, and, and that's what many families, even though they, they said, we would have never come outside on a day with snow or rain, but he really wanted to go. I had to go. And now we're here and seeing children playing outside, making snow angels, um, running up and down the hills collecting rain in, in the bins and having so much fun outside really opened up a new world to all of us and, and uh, something we uh, know we want to continue this school year and even expand in the future. That's it. Thank you so much, Lena and Lisa. Um, that was so wonderful. I will um, stop sharing, right? Sure, yeah. I did see one question in the chat about if we could speak to how this worked for our older elementary students. And um, we actually don't have elementary students. We have um, early childhood and adults. I know there are lots of local and national examples of this working, this approach working really well for elder elementary students, place-based education and living classrooms. And I'm sure there are others on this meeting who could speak to that with firsthand experience. Um, but we, we primarily were using this with our pre-K students. And the, I will say the adults definitely got something out of it, but we just don't, we're not a school that serves elementary. And I'm gonna take a look at the chat to see if there were other questions. Ah, so the adult, someone was, um, Anna was asking if we could describe the adult learning component and the teacher learning component. 
I do have a follow-up question to that question. Are you mostly interested in learning about the, the adult learning component of BRIA in general or how adults and teachers learned about outdoor learning? That's Hold the on, I'm trying to take myself off of mute here. Um, I'm, a, as I'm interested in, in adult learning because as a education leader, I spend more time with adults than I do with, with the littles. And I'm wondering about uh, getting adults comfortable being outside, understanding how to deal with their own discomfort, and then also shifting teachers' mindsets. Any insights you have on that? Thank you. That's a really great question. And Lena, feel free to chime in if I don't um, completely cover this question, but it's multifaceted because you mentioned a lot of good points already. And I think one thing that some things that worked in our favor were the fact that Lydia, who isn't with us today, um, Lena showed the guide that she put together because I think asking teachers to do this from scratch or with nothing would have been a harder or heavier lift. Um, and then trying to connect it to what we already valued and what we already did and had done in the past prior to COVID. We had, um, you know, Reggio was like five years ago or something that we started getting more going deeper with that. But I remember a few years ago, we, we had a goal to really optimize and increase our gross motor opportunities for children, for young children. And then as Nancy mentioned, we had this collaboration, we're able to redo this play space. So outdoor learning, it wasn't completely out of left field. We really tried to ground it in our values and in what children need and in the and then the trauma informed lens. So it we didn't want them to think of it as something like completely new. We had to connect back to what we had done before and then provide them with tangible resources and support that so we had I think we also mentioned that we had a fantastic master gardener who helped us and we were able to contract with her for like a few hours a week to do some of the planting. Um, so the infrastructure and those, those types of support were really helpful for teachers. And then I think a lot of meetings, honestly, where they were heard and where their concerns were heard because there certainly were concerns. And so we needed to do some deep listening and check in a lot. And um, Lena also, I think she, there was a slide about treating each season as a new section of the year. So each season brings new challenges and we needed to have frequent meetings during, as we were gearing up for the next season. Sorry for that alarm noise. Um, and so just not treating it as one year where, okay, here's your guide, go for it. Checking back in, and lots of support and lots of meetings. Lena, do you want to add to that at all? I think that's a great summary. And um, I saw people asking about next school year. And um, again, very similar to what we did last school year, we talked to each teacher, we send out surveys and asked what, you know, what, how would you like to, how much time would you like to be outside next year? And, and as somebody else also pointed out, that it was the first choice. Everybody said, I want to continue to, to teach outside. Um, it makes me happier. And when I'm happier, the children are happier and the opportunities, you know, children have outside our, the environment as a third teacher is just so such a positive experience um, outside um, that all teachers are on board and, and the parents we've been working in with, they have been participating throughout the first weeks and months of outdoor learning. And after it was time for them to step back, many of them were really upset and that that was the best you know, time of, of the day for me to be outside and to connect with nature, connect with my child. And so we have found that through the experience, sometimes it's hard, as Lisa explained, that's why planning through the seasons was really helpful. When you look at it from far away as a big, you know, foreign thing, you know, how do I get started and this will never work. But if you take it little by little and you start slowly, that experience really leads to um, this positive experience and then you see the positive results and that really drives you to want to do it and you find the ways to, to do it together. And I see some other questions like, will Bria continue to provide robust outdoor learning beyond the pandemic? And the answer is yes. <laughs> we are vigorously preparing to start school on August 30th. Um, 
And we are going to continue to provide robust outdoor learning for more children now, because now the expectation is that all children are back. And so it's not as much of a hybrid model as it was before. And um, that is exactly what we're gearing up for right now. Um, so that's a wonderful question. We wouldn't want to end this because it, it just had so many benefits beyond the health and safety of the students and the staff um, and the families. There's just too much to lose by not continuing this. I don't think people want to go backwards. Um, but and then there was another question about um, the structure of the day with regard to the parent program and were adult classes in the morning. Well, we actually um, we have adult classes in the morning and in the afternoon. And last year, the adults were all virtual and we we only had the pre-K students on site. We, we prioritized in person learning for our children, for the children because we knew that it was worse for children to learn from a screen than for the adults. And adults, they also need in-person sometimes, but so next year, the adults will be having a hybrid model and the children will be full-time in-person. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. It's a pretty complicated puzzle to fit in all the adults in the hybrid model and give everybody what they need, but we've managed to um, secure a model that we think is going to work and this is going to be an interesting year to see how it works. And then other qu another question was how can other schools implement, Nancy, I'm sorry, did you want to say something? Oh, no, go ahead with this. I wanted to ask you to talk more about clothing and how you provided clothing and how that worked, but go ahead with other questions too. Sure. Well, we'll do this question and then um, definitely let's talk about clothing. I think, how can other schools implement this now with school starting so soon? I think that's why in the beginning I mentioned that, you know, large scale change with school starting in a week, if you're working in a large system, can seem daunting. And so I guess I would encourage people to do what they can and not get overwhelmed with the enormity of the task. but make small changes even if it's just taking students outdoors for longer and longer chunks of free play and seeking i mean i i think there's a lot of great advocacy work that this group does and um, seeking support from supervisors and advocates in the community because i think so many communities have these advocates and i know bria was personally helped um, and this our effort was bolstered by the wonderful collaboration and support of advocates that weren't necessarily employees of BRIA, but just people who cared about children having the best experiences possible, some of whom are on this call and some who aren't. So, you know, earlier on, we tried to leverage any funding that we had that we were able to divert, not all funding pockets. You can't do that with every piece of funding, but we tried to use what we could and we got a little bit of individual support as well. So I think just don't be daunted by the task and take small steps. And the, out, the clothing that Nancy mentioned, that's important because we, we needed to make sure people had what they, what they needed. Um, so for example, in the winter, we did an outdoor clothing fundraiser. We were able to actually provide uh, out winter clothing for all the children and parents, the parents who were participating and teachers. We wanted teachers to have what they needed. So. Any, anything from um, a warm jacket to snow pants. We had these muddy buddies and boots and toe warmers and foot warmers. The children were very interested in the toe and foot warmers. <laughs> they thought those were really interesting. So um, that was a success and we wanted to get parent buy-in as well. So we met with the parents to ask them to make some of the choices on what types of clothing we should get and um, just really make sure that we were listening to them. I see a couple more questions. One is about the percentage of time, the total percentage of time outdoors that was spent in the outdoor setting. Yeah, we, um, we started small and we started with cohorts because we did virtual learning at the same time. So there was two days on site and then three days virtual. And, and then children are in cohorts. So, you know, it was flip flop um, on the other days. And we only started with 
about two hours um, a day on site outdoor learning. That was important, I think, for everyone. The parents also participated in the beginning, and this was a good time for them um, to be on site with their child and also for the teachers to get started and used to the new environment. And then we increased the time, and we're now outside. We have a six hour long day, and we are outside for the entire day except for nap time, which is about an hour and 15 minutes, but everything else is outside. And just to, to follow up on a little bit of what Lisa was talking about, uh, were there any other particularly important choices that you made that you feel like really made this a success this year? And maybe choices that you're going to choose again in this coming year? Sorry, so choices, which choices were felt like the most important choices that we might continue? Yes. I think... Um, you know, Lydia, Lydia, Lena mentioned revamping our guidance and tweaking it. So, you know, yes, that outdoor learning guide was incredibly helpful. And now it's a new year. So I think making the choice to this summer, you know, revise documents that needed to be revised and really learn from what we had done and what worked well and to continue that. I think we're definitely choosing to also continue working with our amazing gardening teacher. And Lena, do you want to add to the- Yeah, in addition, I was going to say that this, you know, we have three weeks or two weeks of professional development. And just this morning we had an outdoor learning expert from Arlington who I met through the uh, this network, um, Anne-Marie Douglas, come and present talking about her experience. Um, and teachers had really asked, we want to connect with other schools or other people, experts who've been doing outdoor learning. And just those little um, secrets or these little recipes and experiences are so important. They're hands-on and they make you feel connected and make you feel like you want to try out something new or you find a new way to, to try out something or to explain something to a parent. And um, so we, we're doing professional development all of this week just on outdoor learning. Um, and I would say what's been so important for me too is this feeling of working together as a school. We don't have to fight with you know, our principal or the, like we are in this together. We know that this is the safest way of learning right now. We know this is the best way of uh, learning for our young children. And so we just all put our heads together. And when a problem comes up, we brainstorm and we look for support or other resources. But I don't think one person or an outside organization could have done this for us. It was a, it's a process that we developed together and that makes us also feel really good and proud looking back at last year and building on that knowledge and experience for the new school year. Um, I wanna highlight what Susan was saying that for about for the av outdoor learning for the average classroom teacher is overwhelming due to quote unquote classroom management. Training children to see the outdoors as something more than for recess is the first step um, because I think someone else asked about or commented on that, that about classroom management and self-regulation. And I think that's kind of related to what Lena spoke about when um, the differences between the two playgrounds, when we had the more traditional playground, we found that children needed, they tended to run more. Not, not that running's bad, but they tended to, it was not as much of directed play or focus, sometimes just large groups sort of aimlessly running and the play could turn a bit aggressive. And, but when we had like the big recycling containers of plants and they were building, we had cicadas, so they started building cicada hotels, um, you know, just something other than like asphalt and a big space to run. They needed, their attention needed to be directed to these natural elements in a way or guided. And that really, it's true what this, what um, is mentioned by Yalda that it, the teachers did find that classroom management was easier in those sorts of settings and when there was a natural focus, not just running around the plastic train or something. And then someone asked about structural racism and it does come up, yes. Um, most of our families are BIPOC and it definitely comes up and Bria's deeply invested in anti-bias education and equity work and we have lots of, we have a 
adult students who are, they're in a group of student advocates who work on really pressing issues related to, for example, they, they, they were involved in advocating for immigrant families to receive some assi cash assistance. They were pressing on local officials um, advocating for changes to our health care policies. So we, we are, it definitely comes up a lot and it's something to contend with. So uh, we could probably have a whole meeting about that. And we did not know, we did not have to, oh, thank you, it was answered. We did not have to negotiate around health and safety with the union. So I think, Lena, a link to the outdoor learning guide. I think um, we don't have a link to that. We can certainly share with interested people, but we do not have it up on our website. And how many children do we serve at Bria? We have about 200 children at Bria. And I think those were all the questions for now that I saw. Thank you. Thank you guys so, so much. This was just a really fascinating presentation. And I know we could do a whole day with you and and keep on learning more because you're doing such beautiful work. Um, but we really appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much for coming today. It was just a fantastic presentation. So inspiring to see your work and, and we appreciate that you take the time to share it with us as well. So thanks again.